I heard some interesting things um, in discussion today. The first was this idea of local experts. And I'm enamored with local experts because in the traditional buying sequence, in the traditional pharmaceutical selling sequence, local experts are very, very important parts of that dynamic. Um, we have, thank you, local experts and then sort of national experts or out of network experts. And the ability to bring together local thinkers in a particular environment and have them punctuated by external speakers is a very, very powerful dynamic. And I think oftentimes people just sort of look past that really quickly. When you go to buy a car, what you do is you go online and look at the car. You go to the manufacturer's site. But when you buy the car, whose recommendation do you listen to? Your local mechanic. It's a very, very powerful spot of influence. So I was just kind of struck by that, that dynamic about how uh, local influence is, is very, very powerful. So when I look at my crystal ball, when I look at, at the vectors of digital health, when I look at, at momentum shifting, probably a little bit away from Silicon Valley, um, maybe up through, towards Austin and a lot of interesting things going on in New York on the East Coast, and then I turn my attention up to Boston and MIT and some of the pharma companies, I find the vectors pointing in an interesting direction. I touched on this last night, and I, I did a fair amount of thinking yesterday. And the vector points to Toronto. And I don't think that's an accident, and I don't think that it's arbitrary. And looking at, at the nature of the enthusiasm and the excitement, um, um, from last night's meeting and speaking with people today. I think that's a real important point in time. So I don't want you to underscore what's going on in the world today and the fact that this meeting is, is quite important. So I'm going to walk you through a, a whole bunch of concepts here. I run a digital think tank. My job is to sort of think about digital health, and it's called Nostalab. And I'm going to come to you today as a techno-optimist. I realize that there are a lot of problems. There's issues around funding. There's issues around cybersecurity that, that are very, very complicated, electronic medical record. But I want to speak to you today for about, about 45 minutes or so as a, a techno-optimist. And um, I'm going to put aside some of the problems because I want to have a more of an, a positive and optimistic perspective about why today is so important. And when I speak about today, I really do mean today. I don't mean the beginning of the decade or the century. So I want to go over that briefly. But I also want to ask you, how many people here might know what their IQ is? Some of us might have wanted to test it. Some of us might even want to know what our EQ is. Uh, our EQ is that sort of empathic component that's so important. We talk about patient-centric care. And we look about this notion of EQ. But I think there's an emerging reality that I wrote about just recently that I'm calling TQ. And that TQ is your ability to assimilate technology. I've got little kids. When they grow up, I want them to be smart. I want them to understand how to read and write and do math. So I kind of put a check in the box around IQ. I want them also to be empathic. I want them to be good people. I want the kids to get along with one another and their friends and society in a broader world. So I put a check in that EQ box also. But this thing, TQ, is their ability to assimilate and understand technology. And it's no longer a passive opportunity, but it's really their ability to integrate technology into life that's going to be one of the arbiters of success. So I think that technology is beginning to play a different role in our lives. Technology is no longer a passive concern, but an active engagement, and it's becoming fundamental. So I'm going to address that a little bit. But this notion of TQ, and I'm happy to report back to you that TQ also kind of relates a little bit to Toronto Q, because I think that Toronto's ability, receptiveness, is very important. And I don't mean that in a trivial way. I think that your interest in understanding technology and integrating technology into your life, into the lives of those you live with and work with, is very, very important. So congratulations on that. Um, as I evolve this TQ concept, we'll try to figure it out a little bit more. But I think it's an important and interesting, interesting idea. So I talk about digital health all over the place. And this is a, a word cloud with digital health that 
kind of pulls up some of the words that are interesting. I'm not a big fan of the trackers, if you will, the activity trackers. How many people are wearing an activity tracker right now? Wow, isn't that interesting? Almost no one. Almost no one. Nor I. But when we talk about digital health, we tend to kind of hear big ideas and trends emerging now, like artificial intelligence, big data, machine learning, nanoparticles, nanoparticle-mediated cancer detection. So digital health is really not the domain of the mundane tracker. The tracker is extraordinarily important. The problem with the activity tracker is we have to move it from an athletic option to a clinical imperative. The activity tracker now is a device that athletes use to woo their mate. That's the reality. Is I did my 10,000 steps at the gym today. The people who use them don't need them. right? The 65-year-old man sitting on the couch with metabolic syndrome doesn't have a tracker. Well, he does have a tracker, but it's a dust collector in his bedroom. It hasn't been charged, right? So I think it's important to recognize that there are new and important trends going on today. And I want to discuss that from a, both a logistical, practical, functional, and also a philosophical perspective. The point I want to walk away from today is that we're at an interesting time in human history. We are really at this inflection point, this change. That's why you're lucky to be here today. That's why Toronto is so empowered to really be part of this change, to ride this inflection point. And it looks a little cartoony here, but if you want to kind of put stuff on it, you can start to build this out a little bit. And you can see that, that the printing press, that, that Gutenberg moment, that all of a sudden empowered information, kind of the way Google does it today, if you will, that gave us the opportunity to understand and use knowledge, and we move right up through that into chips, into driverless cars, into all interesting dynamics. So there is a bit of a curve there, and I think that curve is reflective of these fundamental changes that, quite frankly, flip people out. The reality of these technological changes are, by their very nature, disruptive. So that's another word that's coming up time and time again, that we're disrupting marketplaces, we're disrupting lifestyles, we're disrupting, in essence, the very fabric of humanity in many, many interesting ways. And that word that comes out of this is this notion of exponential change. Everybody talks about exponential change. But I want to put into perspective what that means. If I were to take one step at a time and go 30 paces, I would get to 30 feet, I'd walk across the room. But if I were to do it exponentially, if I were to take one step, two steps, four steps, in 30 excursions, I would be around the world 26 times. If I gave you a penny and said I'd double it, tomorrow I'll give you two cents, four cents, eight cents, in 26 days you'd be a millionaire, 26 days. That's the nature of exponential change. It's very rapid, and it's very, very unsettling. So I think it's important that we recognize that context of change. Now, here's the big takeaway. I want you to take a good look at this chart. <clears throat> exponential change brings with it trouble. It brings with it problems. Because if we look at our traditional linear model, the black line, everybody knows about linear growth. Give me 5% growth, give me 10% growth, whatever it is, and I want it year on and year on. That, that's the way I'm going to manage my business. The life science industry kind of looks at the world this way, whether it be profit, sales, or even drug development. It's a very linear perspective. However, when we see rapid shifts, two things emerge, and it's very, very important as people in business and clinical practice to recognize that sometimes in an exponential model, the shift early on is below the line. So your boss comes to you and said, we're expecting 3% growth this quarter, and you have negative 1% growth. If you don't recognize this aspect of disappointment, you can get yourself in trouble. Your business model looks like it might be failing. Your boss might be missing his or her numbers. So disappointment is part of that process. So just be aware. Plan for it, understand that's the nature of exponential change. The other thing is this idea of growth. When things start happening, when the blank hits the fan, if you will, you either have this notion of chaos. For example, you have product samples that you need to get into the marketplace, but you're seeing tremendous growth 
and your supply chain can't live up to those expectations. That manifests in chaos. I've seen it time and time again. So that chaos is intrinsically disruptive. Now, if you are prepared, you visit this other world. It's not chaos, but absolute amazement. So exponential growth carries with it intrinsic issues that can be problematic, but also become amazing. So when we talk about this, I want you to really kind of keep that in perspective and plan for it. Recognize that failure and disappointment is intrinsic to this business path. 